guys, it's Nina from VR Focus. I am joined here by... Michael Ludden, and I'm the director of Watson Developer Labs, and we have, as part of our team's mission, an AR VR Labs initiative, which is why we're here talking, I think. So tell me a little bit about what you've been building. How big is your team? How did you guys get to building it in the first place? So we've got a small team. Uh, I have a couple of product managers uh, and an engineering organization. At the beginning of 2016, I was realizing that there are all these headsets coming out that had microphones on them that were VR headsets, consumer-focused VR headsets, Oculus Rift, HTC Vive. There were rumors about Google Daydream. There were rumors about uh, PlayStation VR, and those ended up being true. Um, I was working on Watson and building use case-based solutions for developers before I started this team. And I thought, well, actually, our, our platform is kind of tailor-fit for this coming onslaught of, of VR content because it's cloud-based, and you can uh, make API calls to almost every platform, including PlayStation and PC. And we can make use of those microphones because we have a really robust uh, speech interaction system. We have two services that we ended up using in the VR speech sandbox, which is what we built, um, which basically wraps a little bit of sample code and our uh, Unity SDK for Watson, which makes it really easy for developers to build from within Unity uh, and a speech interaction system for any AR or VR application. And then we took that to VRLA, uh, a conference for, for virtual reality in Los Angeles, showed it off to some industry folks, and uh, there was interest because we were early. People were thinking about, obviously, immersion in other ways. They were thinking about the ability to walk around, touch things, look at things, hear things, spatial audio. But really, the microphone was underserved. But I consider it a fourth dimension of immersion if you can speak to a world and have it be altered around you. It's kind of a magical experience. We validated the concept, and that's where I met uh, actually Ubisoft. Uh, went to them and said, hey, can we use this as kind of a pilot to showcase the power of the solution that we built? Because we think we have something here. Um, and fast forward a year later, uh, we have a Watson-powered voice interaction feature there. Um, based on the work we did with the VR Speech Sandbox, that also gave me air cover to build the team. We are now working on a number of VR and AR use case-based solutions for developers. We've done various versions of the VR Speech Sandbox for different uh, VR headsets, and we're currently looking to expand beyond Unity into supporting Unreal and possibly other popular game engines that are used for development of AR and VR content. Where you mentioned augmented reality yep. as well. Can you give me some examples of what you might be working on or how it can be used in the future? That's a good question. I can't give you examples of what we're working on, but it's exciting and I hope that we're going to be able to make some announcements towards the end of this year or the beginning of next year in terms of augmented reality. However, what I can say is the VR speech sandbox is perfectly usable for augmented reality use cases. Um, there's nothing that says it has to be something that's created for just virtual reality. We're talking to a number of companies that have uh, had their ears perk up and you know everything from if you're using AR kit on iOS and it's a, sort of a world building map where you can just tell it to populate a, a fictional ground with hills or trees or people or sheep. So, so as a method of control, it makes instant and, and a lot of sense for almost every VR application, at least as one control option, uh, whether that's to start or stop the, the, the demo to be able to get help if you, if you are lost in a puzzle game, for example, or in productivity use cases, calling up things that you did before quickly with your voice to eliminate having to rifle through menus in VR. Um, and in AR, you know, I think that it's very nascent in terms of voice use cases. I will say there are non-voice Watson applications for AR that we're looking into building, and that's pretty much the most I can hint at at this point. I feel very strongly that AR and VR are one platform ultimately in the future going forward. It's just limited by form factor at the moment, but once we get full six degrees of freedom VR on a mobile headset that's reasonably glasses sized, that'll start to merge with augmented reality, and VR will simply be full screen for augmented reality. If I was like a developer and I didn't know how to do any of this, I find that quite, quite scary. Yeah. Is it, is, it, is, it, is it a difficult learning curve to go through all of this? Do yeah. you have to learn how to use a whole new software? Is it, you think, a little bit? Good question. I think it's actually surprisingly, ridiculously simple, especially if you're just prototyping in, in Unity, to get up and running, not just with our solution, but in general. I mean, you can have a sandbox with physics up and running in five minutes and put on a, a, an HTC Vive headset and walk around in it. Really, our solution is meant to be as much of a drag and drop solution as it can be. We have a robust how-to guide. I mean, you could get a voice interaction system up and running in less than an hour in an existing application or in a new one. Uh, so I would say that actually the barrier to entry, it sounds 
really scary, really advanced. Virtual reality must be so much more difficult than, you know, game development or, or just like 2D stuff for mobile. But really, no, the reverse is kind of true. I mean, they make it so easy. I would recommend everybody get involved, even if you're not a developer, because the Unity environment specifically is very WYSIWYG. Uh, there's a lot of dragging and dropping, and you almost don't even have to touch scripts. So I tried out two demos here today. I tried the Star Trek Bridge Crew, uh, wherein I tra played an absolutely terrible commander. <laughs> Make it happen. Hi. There you go. <laughs> Get closer to Bird of Prey. Hi. Understood. Staying with them. Ooh. There you go. Shields. Bring the shields up. Shields raised. Armed torpedoes. Torpedoes. Fire torpedo. I'm blocking new target. Firing. Oh. Fire torpedoes at enemy. Oh my god. Fire at enemy. Fire everything. Understood. There, there you go. go. Oh. oh my god. Did you hit something? Avoid the asteroid. <laughs> what are you doing? Turn off the fire. <laughs> Put out the fire. Put out the fire. <laughs> We're on fire. Someone <laughs> clean up the fire. <laughs> it was very mention, entertaining. It was very entertaining. Not to mention I've got obviously like a really strange accent that goes completely all yeah, over the place. Yeah, that's right. Um, but what did it demonstrate? Fix the hull. Say again. Fix the hull. <laughs> Oh, the Wait, they're, <laughs> they're, they're British too, though. Because I, I think it did understand when you were giving it the commands it expected, you know, generally speaking, what you were saying. I also did another demo, yeah. where, which was the actual sandbox, um, where I, you go in and you have to point sort of with your um, controller where you want an object to appear, and you can shoot it, you can shoot guns. <laughs> and she did. <laughs> and you can destroy things. It, it was kind of like Minecraft, where suddenly you're like, yeah. you want to build something, something appears. Or like scribble knots. Yeah, you play thing. around with it, you see what happens, and it's, it's, it's fun. Yeah, and there's like, I don't know, a couple hundred objects in the game, you have to kind of discover what you can and can't make, and it was meant to highlight other aspects than what Star Trek highlighted, so the extensibility, so you could say, a big black, create a big black dragon, or a small blue dragon, you could change the size and the color. And just, just to showcase the sort of, the, the ability of the system to handle modifications and also variations in what you say. Blue dragon. And I'll tell you so you're noticing creates. the variation in my phrasing? Same result, right? Create, give me, these are things that aren't hard coded into the system, but it understands and parses nonetheless into the intent. Create a small blue dragon. Finally, the last thing was, I really like to highlight this, you don't have to use a keyword, you were just talking. So anytime it heard you issuing a command to create something, or make something, or build something, or whatever variation, it actually just took that action. And it's fairly seamless, because we were talking, and it's listening to all that, and passing it to the system. But it's only taking action when it understands that your intent is, I want to make this thing in the world. I mean, what I thought was quite interesting was that I said, um, create Santa Claus. And <laughs> yeah. instead of Santa Claus, it created a snowman. That was interesting. Because it was a holiday season yeah. thing. That was, I, ha I don't have an explanation for that. That was cool, though. You know, there's 7 million um, uh, AR self-identified AR VR developers as of 2017. Last year, it was around 100,000. It's exploding. It's only going to get bigger from here. Um, and, and we want to be right there at the cutting edge, at the bleeding edge, serving this community from the very start. It's like real truthfully grounded things that developers can come up with that are problems they want solved that we can actually build. Um, I'm all ears and so is my team. But in general, if there are developers out there and they're growing exponentially, what, what kind of tips would you give them? If they're going into this business, yeah. what would you definitely say, go, go and do this, learn it? Okay, um, I would say that if you're thinking long term, um, think outside of gaming and entertainment. Uh, think of what could be serious use cases for AR and VR in terms of the four areas we talked about. Um, productivity, education, therapy, and training. Where I would love to see more effort is around um, things that are you know, harder to monetize in the immediate term but are very necessary for our future. Education, therapy. Um, there's a, there's a, there is a lot of work and money going into helping vet veterans with, with PTSD, 
uh, using virtual reality. But I think in general, VR and AR allow us an unprecedented ability to kind of hack our own brains and our own pleasure centers and retrain them. And if we consider that an awesome responsibility and something that could be abused very easily, um, people who are ethical should really start to, to, to lead the efforts to define what is ethical in those areas. And, and by, doing, by creating content, you kind of do, do that. I would also love to see people uh, doing more in terms of um, spatial programming. So imagine visual programming is like you string together nodes in a 2D screen and you eventually build a system and you can deploy an application. But if you're building a sufficiently complex application, you'll be scrolling limitlessly to the right. So spatial uh, programming allows us the opportunity to have a visual programming interface where I could place a node here, I could place a node there, I'll never forget, and if I go somewhere else in the room, I'll kind of see how they're all connected together naturally through my spatial memory uh, and reasoning. And so if you think about uh, VR and AR and, and you're not dead set on gaming and entertainment, um, there is a lot of stuff there, there's a lot of money going into that, but I think that, that, that you have to be aware that the user base is growing um, and you gotta think three to five years out because there's a lot of investment, there's a lot of content being developed, and I wouldn't expect that tomorrow you're gonna get extremely rich no matter what area you choose. Uh, but um, if you play for the medium to long, long term, AR and VR are going to be the next major computing platform. And if you just keep iterating, like I see some companies doing where they started uh, with you know, a very simple idea like Tivoli or something, and they keep adding features to it. There is a first mover's advantage, and somebody's going to snap up that company or that's going to turn into a profitable product at, at, at some point if you can just kind of uh, keep the faith, you know. And we're right there with you. I guess that's my advice. <laughs> <laughs> and what would you say, like, just don't avoid it. Just don't do it. Lots of developers have gone to that pitfall and they get stuck there and their product fails. Wave shooters. It's been done. It's going to go down in history as space this. invaders. It's like, you know, the space invaders for the VR era is what all these wave shooters are going to be. I play them. I like Space Pirate Trainer, um, but we got enough of those and you're probably not going to make a ton of money or even get people to play it unless you're a Ubisoft or an EA or and you're bringing a licensed property. So far, obviously, you've tried lots of VR and AR. Do you have like a personal favorite? Oh, one favorite. AR VR experience. I'll list two or three in no no particular order. Because it was one of the first vid music videos I watched in VR, I really like, uh, and it's a bit dated at this point, but it's available on PlayStation VR and it's uh, by Kygo. It's a music video uh, called Carry Me. And I, I really like um, the experimentation that they did. So the video starts out, you're very small, you're almost microscopically small. And throughout the video, you kind of grow to the size of an entire universe. And then by the very end, spoiler alert, that universe looks like a cell, and it's almost like you're starting over. And, you know, there's something magical about it. It's almost like taking a drug, really. Um, and so I, I really liked that experience. Another one that I, I liked on PlayStation VR, actually, Joshua Carr experience. I forget if it's that or if his last name is different, but basically he's a famous violinist. And they did a bunch of photogrammetry in a room like this. And so what it ends up looking like is a live performance with a real person like you're sitting next to me that I can actually look around and it feels like that is not a, a, poly, a polygonal rec representation, but a real person standing there and playing. And I can look at the people playing on the, on the keyboard and that looks real as well. It's really uh, a, a glimpse into the future. Once this technology gets a little bit more standardized, you'll see more and more content like that. I really like Fruit Ninja VR. I'm a bit addicted to that just because of the leaderboard thing. I gave you unlimited amount of money. Thank you. With an unlimited team. Sweet. And you could build whatever the hell you wanted. What would you want to build? Whoa. I would probably build AR Wikipedia because I would love the ability to just point a phone at something and know everything about whatever I'm looking at. For AR, that. For VR, I would build a story-driven uh, game in which you interact with your voice with non-human uh, virtual characters and in that way progress in the story. I'm fascinated by the idea that like my own mind could be fooled in VR that I'm talking to a real person and if there's a story that tugs on my emotional heartstrings and I I feel empathy for a non a non-human person in a game I want to help them that that is really interesting to me. <laughs> Where can we go to find out more information? To Google GitHub VR Speech Sandbox that'll get you uh, first the HTC Vive build but you can see the other ones as well. Um, and we'll have more coming very soon. Amazing. Well, thank you so much. Thank and you. Head over to vrfocus.com if you want to find out any more about what they're up to, and I will see you there. Please try it out. It's really cool, I promise.